Good evening, church. Uh, welcome to this evening's sermon. Before we get started, though, we're actually going to see a video from Nathan Spires that he sent us on Friday, hence the awkward introduction from my bedroom, because I was still editing the sermon when we got the video. So please watch this first, and then we're going to see the sermon from Pastor Ian. Buenos días. Buenos días. Somos parte de la brigada de, de rastrillar. Está bien. Nos va a colaborar con unas preguntas, ¿ya? Está bien. ¿Cuántas familias viven en esta casa? Unita. Una. ¿Su nombre completo? Mi nombre completo, Nathan John Spice. ¿Cuántos integrantes son en su familia? Somos seis. ¿De los seis menores de cinco años? Ninguno. ¿Mayores de sesenta? Ninguno. ¿Alguno de, sus, de su familia ha tenido algún síntoma durante las dos últimas semanas como pérdida del olfato, del gusto, fiebre? No. no ¿Todos se encuentran sanitos? Sí. ¿No han estado en contacto con algún familiar no. con coronavirus positivo, nada? ¿no? Bueno, bueno. Entonces, como todos se encuentran sanos, las únicas recomendaciones que le vamos a dejar es que sigan con las medidas de bioseguridad, ¿ya? Yeah. Hay una aplicación en el celular, tienen que descargarlo, se llama Ay. Salud Cochabamba. Well, good afternoon, friends. That little video that you just saw was of a community COVID sweep. Right now in Bolivia, hundreds of teams of volunteers made up of a medical student who's a volunteer, and then three military personnel have gone door to door, suburb by suburb, looking for COVID cases, people with COVID. And the reason they're doing that is because testing is very expensive in Bolivia, and it's really the only way to identify cases and try and get people to stay at home. The sad truth is that Bolivia right now is being smashed by the coronavirus. The hospitals are full. There's very regularly deceased people in the street. Um, Bolivia's deaths are soaring and the cemetery system is completely overloaded. Right now, Bolivia is in a really difficult spot. The Bolivian government has done everything they can and since the middle of March, we have been in various iterations of complete lockdown or um, slightly flexibilized dynamic quarantines is what they're called here. And so during this whole period from the 22nd of March on, we have had curfew from 6 p.m. at night. We've been in lockdown and for extended periods, not even been allowed to drive in our cars. Entry into banks and supermarkets is controlled according to the um, numbers in our car net, the last digit, to try and avoid um, concentrations of people. We've spent a lot of time queuing and carrying our shopping home. Uh, this lockdown has also had a very substantial effect on the lives and routines of our children. And so there's been no school since uh, the 12th of March, our kids, from the 12th of March up until yesterday, Sunday, have done all of their classes via Zoom. And so you can imagine four little kids trying to share the technology that we have in the home. Um, this has been a really challenging period for them. They have not left the house since the 22nd of March. They have not left the front gate. And so it's a really amazing time in their lives too. You might wonder how we keep children entertained locked up in their house and so I thought I'd just share a few little videos with you so you might get a little bit of an insight into their um, reality. Of course this coronavirus pandemic is not just affecting families it's also affects ministry and right now we any ministry that cannot be done via zoom any face-to-face -face ministry simply has stopped and so church bible study preaching meetings pastors meetings um, board meetings for roots all of this happens on zoom right now i'd like to present to you our new director Pastor Fernando Fernandez. He was previously a medical doctor. Now he's a pastor. He is a fine preacher and has a very kind heart. He's a man ideally suited to Roots' ministry of building up uh, Christian leaders in Bolivia and caring for pastors. Um, he's going to tell you a little bit now about what being a pastor is like in Bolivia. 
Buenos días hermanos, me llamo Fernando Fernández, soy el director de Raíces para Bolivia. En este tiempo quisiera compartir con ustedes las necesidades que están pasando nuestros pastores en nuestro país. Ya han fallecido más de 100 pastores a consecuencia de esta pandemia. Pero no solo eso, la pandemia ha ocasionado que se cierren nuestras iglesias por más de cuatro meses. Y al cerrarse las iglesias, los pastores han dejado de recibir sus sueldos debido a que la economía de las iglesias en Bolivia no es muy fuerte. Por eso es que queremos solicitar su ayuda para estos pastores, porque detrás de cada pastor hay una familia necesitada. Dios les bendiga. It's the right moment to tell you also, friends, that Kate and I have made the difficult decision to return to Australia. Ministry right now in Bolivia is very difficult, and just recently um, a path has opened up for us to be able to fly through Miami and back to Sydney. And with the future so uncertain, we have decided to uh, make that decision and fly back to Sydney to relocate and resettle in Australia. We leave roots in good hands with Pastor Fernando and Kate and I are looking forward to starting a new chapter in our lives. However, it's with heavy hearts that we leave because we leave our friends. We leave our friends in the middle of a very severe trial. And many of them, we simply cannot farewell. We can't say goodbye in person. And after really 14 years of ministry related to Bolivia, um, it's very difficult to not be able to see the people that we love on the way out And so, friends, I ask you please to be praying for our families. We process this change. Um, it's difficult for our kids as well as for us. I pray, ask that you would pray for this terrible situation in Bolivia, for the suffering that's here. We pray for the Lord's mercy on Bolivia. And we ask that you would also pray for us as we begin a new chapter in our lives um, and pray for the Lord's leading as to what comes next. Thank you, friends, for listening. Thank you for your support. We appreciate it very much. Ciao, ciao. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our evening sermon. I trust that uh, you are all keeping well. And um, uh, again, we are hoping at some point to be able to get back together, but we're not quite there yet. Uh, we continue to talk about it and we continue to think of ways in which we can meet. So be patient. Um, hopefully it will happen sooner rather than later. This evening we're going to be reading from Joshua chapter 3. If you have your Bibles with you, can I encourage you to open them, uh, whether that's on your phone or your iPad, your computer, laptop, or whether it's a Bible like I have in my hands. Can you open it to Joshua chapter 3. Early in the morning, Joshua and all the Israelites set out from Shittim and went to the Jordan where they camped before crossing over. After three days, the officials went through the camp, giving orders to the people. When you see the Ark of the Covenant of Yahweh your God and the priests your Levites carrying it, you are to move from your positions and follow it. Then you will know which way to go, since you have never been this way before, but keep a distance of about a thousand yards between you and the ark. Do not go near it. Joshua told the people, consecrate yourselves, for tomorrow Yahweh will do amazing things among you. Joshua said to the priests, take up the ark of the covenant and pass on ahead of the people. So they took it up and went ahead of them. And Yahweh said to Joshua, Today I will begin to exalt you in the eyes of all Israel so that they may know that I am with you as I was with Moses. Tell the priests who carry the Ark of the Covenant, when you, go reach, when you reach the edge of the Jordan waters, go and stand in the river. Joshua said to the Israelites, Come here and listen to the words of Yahweh, your God. This is how you will know that the living God is among you and that he will certainly drive out before you the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Hivites, the Perizzites, the Girgashites, the Amorites, and the Jebusites. See, the Ark of the Covenant of Yahweh of all the earth will go into the Jordan ahead of you. 
Now then, choose 12 men from the tribes of Israel, one from each tribe. And as soon as the priests who carry the ark of Yahweh, the Lord of all the earth, set foot in the Jordan, its waters flowing downstream will be cut off and stand up in a heap. So when the people broke camp to cross the Jordan, the priests carrying the ark of the covenant went ahead of them. Now the Jordan was at flood stage or during the harvest. Yet as soon as the priests who carried the ark reached the Jordan and their feet touched the water's edge, the water from upstream stopped flowing. It piled up in a heap a great distance away at a town called Adam in the vicinity of Zarethan, while the water flowing down to the sea of the Araba, the salt sea, was completely cut off. So the people crossed over the opposite uh, Jericho. The priest who carried the Ark of the Covenant of Yahweh stood firm on dry ground in the middle of the Jordan while all Israel passed until the whole nation had completed the crossing on dry ground. This is God's word. Let's pray together. Our Father, we thank you for this wonderful account of how Miraculously, you opened up the Jordan River and enabled your people to cross on dry land in spite of the flood that was occurring at the time. It reminds us of your greatness. And what a great privilege it is for us to be able to spend some time just reading and listening and hearing your word to us. O oh Lord, we ask that you would open our eyes, enable us to understand what you are saying to us. Unstop those ears that may be deaf. Break down the stubbornness of our hearts that sometimes causes us not to hear what you are saying. Give us minds that are receptive. Give us ears that will hear. Give us the ability to put into practice what we learn. May our faith be expressed not by words but by actions. And so we ask this evening that we would hear from you. For Jesus' sake. Amen. A poor heathen woman became a Christian and was remarkable for her simple faith. In accepting Christ, she took him literally at his word. Some months after her conversion, her little child fell sick. Its recovery was doubtful. Ice was needed for the little one, but in that tropical country, away from the great cities, it was not to be had. I'm going to ask God to send ice, the mother said to the missionary. Oh, but you can't expect that he will do that, was the quick reply. Why not, asked the simple-hearted mother. He has all the power and he loves us. You told us so. I shall ask him and I believe he will send it. So she did ask him in prayer and God did answer. Soon there came upon them a heavy thunderstorm accompanied by hail. The woman was able to gather a large bowlful of hailstones. The cold application was just what she needed, and the child recovered. One of the dangers I think that we face as Christians is when we hear stories like that, it's almost as if it's at arm's length away from us. It's almost as if in our minds we say, you know, that happens to other people. These things don't happen to us. And while inwardly we may believe that God is a great God, when it comes to expecting God to do great things, sometimes our own limitations, our own short-sightedness, our own perhaps lack of faith, of trust in God's power, causes us to think small, causes us to doubt God's ability, causes us to question whether or not God is able to move in our circumstances. Sometimes you may be faced with a desperate situation, and from a human perspective, when you look at it, it's impossible to resolve. How am I going to address this? How am I going to get a solution out of this? 
How am I going to overcome this massive challenge that I face? Loss of a job, a marriage breakdown, a problem child, perhaps financial stress. Perhaps it is that you have emotional problems and you're a little bit depressed and you've been plunged into darkness and you're just wondering how on earth am I ever going to get out of this? And we need to be reminded that we serve a great and glorious God. A God who is able to turn the impossible into the possible. And this story reminds us that in spite of the insurmountable odds that faced Israel, God moved in their midst and God did what was humanly impossible. And the author wants to stress the impossibility of what lies in front of the Israelites. He wants them to understand that if they rely upon their own strength, and if they look to themselves to provide a solution on how they're going to get these millions of people across the Jordan River that is raging in flood, that they will fail again and again and again. But if they will but trust God, if they will put their confidence in Him, if they will expect Him to move and trust His word to them through Joshua, then God will move in a miraculous way and God will accomplish His purposes for them. For it falls within the purposes of God for Israel to cross that Jordan, to go into the land that God has promised them. And let me tell you, Christian, God is always faithful to his promises. God cannot break his promises. And where God has revealed promises in his word, you and I can hold on to those and we can rely upon them and we can trust that God will honor his promises for the sake of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so can I encourage you, Whatever your situation might be, I don't know what's going on in all of your lives. I know what's going on in some of your lives, but not all of them. And sometimes there are things happening that are hidden from sight that people keep to themselves and they don't let anyone else know. Can I encourage you this evening to hear how this great God that we serve is able to move into your situation and able to accomplish what seems to you to be insurmountable odds. Firstly, I want you to notice the necessity of proper preparation. The necessity of proper preparation. Look at verses 1 through to 6. Verses 1 through to 6. Early in the morning, Joshua and all the Israelites set out from Shittim and went to the Jordan where they camped before crossing over. After three days, the officials went throughout the camp, giving orders for the people, when you see the Ark of the Covenant of Yahweh your God and the priests who are Levites carrying it, you are to move out from your positions and follow it. Then you will know which way to go, since you have never been this way before. But keep a distance of about a thousand yards between you and the ark. Do not go near it. Joshua told the people, hear carefully now, Consecrate yourselves, for tomorrow Yahweh will do amazing things among you. Joshua said to the priests, Take up the ark of the covenant and pass on ahead of the people. So they took up it up and went ahead of them. Since God is glorious, since God is great, since God is powerful, since God is holy, it is necessary for God's people to prepare themselves for God to move in their midst. And, and so God encourages them and commands them and tells them to get ready before he moves. And it's important that they remember it is God who will move. Hence, the ark plays a central role. If you remember and you know your Bible, and I'm sure all of you do, you know that the ark of the covenant is central to the life of Israel. In the ark of the covenant are the Ten Commandments. And that ark of the covenant symbolized God's presence. 
so that the, the ark travels before them because you will know that the pillar of fire is gone and the cloud is gone since they've reached the point at which they're going to enter into the land. And so now they are going to be guided by the ark as a visible symbol, a visible sign, if you like, of God's presence with them. A reminder that as they cross over the Jordan into the promised land, it is by God's divine power that they enter into the land. Now they are uh, to remain a certain distance from the ark, and there are probably two reasons for that. The first reason is that the, if they got too close to the ark, they would be obscured as to the path they needed to follow. And, and so they needed to remain a certain uh, amount of distance back from the ark so they could follow carefully. Remember that the people would have been spread out and in a long line behind the ark. The second reason that they are to remain behind the ark is because God is holy. And because God is holy, they need to understand that they shouldn't get too close to the ark. I mean, we know what happens when the ark is not handled correctly. When David is bringing the ark back that has been captured by the Philistines and is residing in one of their cities, and the priests bring it back, you remember what happens on the way back. One of the oxen uh, with the ark stumble, and, and one of the priests reaches out to touch the ark, and God strikes that priest dead and David is so scared and so fearful as a result of that that he just leaves it as is. God's holiness is something for us to remember, something for us to respect. Now it's not that we we should be so scared of God's holiness that it prevents us from entering into his presence because Jesus Christ has opened up the way for us to come into the very throne room of God. Jesus has made the path open to us, hence the temple curtain is torn in two, symbolizing that once people who could only go into the holy, holy, the high priest is now open to everyone. So we have access into God's presence. Nevertheless, that doesn't mean we simply treat God's holiness as ordinary. We treat God as ordinary. We must remember that God's holiness means that no one can see him and live. Such is the nature of who God is. And we are reminded again in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 28 and 29, if I can read those verses to you, just to remind you. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe. Why? Because our God is a consuming fire. And so what is true of the Israelites remains true for us today, that when we approach God, we must remember that we are approaching a holy God. And we come on the basis of the work that has been done by the Lord Jesus Christ. That means that when we are coming into the presence of God and when we are preparing to worship together, that there ought to be some measure of preparation that is undertaken by us. Sometimes when people come to church and they leave church and they leave and they say, well, I didn't really get anything out of that. Sometimes the reason for that is because they haven't adequately prepared themselves. And so they come into the time where we spend worshipping God together as his people, unprepared. And then they expect somehow in their unpreparedness to receive something, and often they don't. Now sometimes God, because he is so gracious, enables them to experience his presence and to be uh, spoken to by him and to be moved by him because he is so gracious. But we should not presume upon that. We should not Treat God as unholy by just thinking, you know, we don't have to do any kind of preparation. And so God says to his people, not only ought you to remain a distance behind the ark, but consecrate yourself. This is something you need to prepare yourself for. I'm going to move in your midst. I'm going to do something spectacular. I'm going to do something supernatural. And when this occurs, I want you to be adequately prepared. I want you to be ready. I want your heart to be in the right place. Is that not the same 
thing that you and I need to do in the presence of God, that we come prepared, that we ask God to move in our midst, that we prepare our hearts before him, that we consecrate ourselves to him, that we bring ourselves and bow before him in worship, and we come expecting God to move when his word is preached, when we worship together, whenever we are able to get back together. And even now in these circumstances where I'm hoping that some of you are gathering together in homes so that it's not just a couple worshiping together or one person, but rather a group of people gathering in home. And as we worship together, do we come ready and willing and able and prepared to worship God? Or do we just walk into his presence unprepared, hoping that something is going to happen? They needed to understand something significant was going to happen. And I think sometimes when we come into God's presence as a corporate group of people, as a congregation, we don't expect a lot, do we? We kind of come sort of thinking, oh, look, this is what I do on a Sunday and, and, I, and I wonder if God's going to do anything amongst us. We should come expectantly. We should come thinking that this great God we serve, this awesome God we serve is going to move amongst us and is going to touch us, change us, shape us, transform us. When I was much, much younger, um, we went on a field trip as a grade 7 class. Uh, we were in a small school. There was only one class in the whole of grade 7. And they took us to a place in South Africa in Zululand called Isant Luana. And at Isant Luana, there was a, a battle that took place. It was on top of a hill. There was a British garrison uh, that was stationed there, well, near there at Rourke's Drift. And uh, the Zulus gathered at the bottom of this mountain to attack these British soldiers that were there. Uh, and as the, the British saw them gathering at the bottom, it was too great a force for them to oppose. And so they began to retreat back to Rourke's Drift. And there was this path they had to follow and uh, a number of kilometers away to get back to their fort that they had at Rourke's Drift where it was fortified and they had more soldiers and they needed to warn the garrison there that the Zulu army was on its way to attack. And as they fled, they were pursued by the Zulu warriors uh, down this uh, path to Rockstriff. I can't remember how many kilometers it was. And as a class, we were told the stories. We sat atop that hill. And then we gathered as we walked down to the bottom. And we began to walk that path that those soldiers fled and remembering they had full kit and they were running uh, as fast as they could and it was quite a long way it was quite an arduous walk until eventually we arrived at Rourke's Drift the very fact of our preparation the very fact of what we knew happened and the very fact of the fear of those soldiers lives uh, un under threat under danger being pursued reminded us of the gravity of the situation and it gave us a whole different meaning to walking down that path, knowing that some of them actually fell on that path and were slaughtered and killed and lost their lives. It added a certain reverence to that walk we went on and a certain ambience to the battle that occurred then at Rourke's Drift where we slept overnight. And so when we come into God's presence, it should be even much greater than that, realizing that this is the God of all glory. This is the King of kings. We coming into his chambers. We coming into his throne room. We coming to worship not just a local deity. We coming to worship the God who is king over all the world. And that ought to inspire us to prepare ourselves, to make sure that we're in the right place spiritually, that our hearts are ready and open to receive from God. And we should expect great things. Secondly, I want you to notice the necessity of trusting God. If it's proper preparation, they needed to trust God, verses 7 through to 13. Let me read those verses, verses 7 through to 13. 
And Yahweh said to Joshua, Today I will begin to exalt you in the eyes of all Israel, so that they may know that I am with you as I was with Moses. Tell the priests who carry the Ark of the Covenant, When you reach the edge of the Jordan waters, go and stand in the river. Joshua said to the Israelites, Come here and listen to the words of Yahweh your God. This is how you will know that the living God is among you, that he will certainly drive out before you the Canaanites and all the other ites. See, the ark of the covenant of Yahweh of all the earth will go into the Jordan ahead of you. Now then, choose 12 men from each of the tribes of Israel, one from each tribe. And as soon as the priests who carry the ark of the Yahweh, the Lord of all the earth, set foot in the Jordan, the waters flowing downstream will be cut off and stand up in a heap. Now we mustn't miss the miracle of this. It's very easy for us to miss the miracle. First, notice how, how Yahweh says he will exalt Joshua in their sight. In other words, it's, it's a reminder that Joshua is God's leader. Joshua is God's appointment. It's not that Joshua accomplishes great things. No, it's that God, through Joshua, accomplishes great things. And God has called Joshua to be his spokesman, to be his leader. And God will use Joshua in a powerful way because Joshua has been obedient to the call of God. Joshua has heard the voice of God. And Joshua has followed in the footsteps of Moses. And in spite of this awesome task that he has, in spite of this incredible weight of responsibility that falls upon his shoulders in leading the people now into the promised land that God has promised on earth to their forefathers, Joshua takes up the reins and confidently he goes goes ahead because he trusts in Yahweh. Now, can I say to you, my dear friend, when God calls you to do something, God will not lead you where his grace will not sustain you. Hear that very carefully. When God asks you to do something in obedience to him, if God calls you, and he will call some of you to be a pastor, then God will equip you to be a pastor. Don't allow all the barriers that you can think of to prevent you to res from responding to God's call. If God calls you to be a missionary, and you need to submit in obedience and go to some faraway land, and you've got all kinds of fears that are preventing you from doing that, know that if God lays that upon your heart and you are sure that's what God wants you to do, God will equip you. Know that if God calls you to serve him in a ministry, in a church, and this is God's hand upon you, and God is moving and convicting you to get involved in that role, in youth, in young adults, in a, leading a home group, whatever the case may be, know this, that God will strengthen you. God will enable you. It is not your weaknesses that God is so concerned about. In fact, it is weak people that God raises up and uses. God delights in weaknesses. Your weaknesses are no barrier to God. God will demonstrate his strength in your weaknesses. You will be able to do things that on your own strength you would never be able to do because God's grace will so descend upon you that he will be the one working in and through you to accomplish his purposes to that which he has called you to do. So can I encourage you, if you feel God tapping you on the shoulder and saying to you, my dear friend, I want you to be a pastor, I want you to help out at youth, I want you to be involved in playgroup, I want you to go to a faraway land, I want you to take that job up, even though it seems impossible for you, because at that workplace, I'm going to use you in an amazing and powerful way, then trust in Yahweh, put your faith and your confidence in Him. It's not your abilities that matter, it's God's ability that matters, and God delights, they hear this, God delights to take weak people to raise them up and to thrust them out because then when he accomplishes things through them, he gets the glory and he gets the honor. 
Notice too that the possession of the land is a reaffirmation of God's promises. God has said to this uh, forefathers, he would provide for them a land that languished in Egypt for 400 years. Now the promise is about to happen. Now it's about to be realized. Now this generation, this new generation is going to cross into the land and they are going to see firsthand that God is always faithful to his promises. God never goes back on his word. God's word is sure. It is true. It can be relied upon. That's why it's authoritative. You can trust in God's word. You can know that when God has said something, he is reliable and you can put your faith in him and in those promises that are revealed in God's word. Notice the process that God, or the logical process that God shows them. He says, when you cross over the Jordan, they will experience this incredible miracle and you go into the land. You don't have to worry about all the ites that are in the land, the Hittites, the Hivites, the Jebusites and all the other ones. You don't have to worry about them. In fact, you see that parting of that Jordan River would provide the encouragement and would cause the courage to well up within the Israelites to know that if God can part the Jordan, then God can defeat those people in the land as powerful as they may seem and as well established as they may seem. It would put courage in them. And it is true when we look back on how God has moved in the past and how God has raised up so many different people and so many weak people and thrust them out in ministry that we can take courage from that. And as we look back to our own lives and see what God has accomplished in them, that we can go back and remind ourselves that God is more than capable of using us in his work and strengthening us to his work. The God the Christian serves is a miracle working God. He is a powerful God. We should never underestimate him. We should never reduce him. We should never put him in a box. We should never put him in a straitjacket and somehow think that God can only move according to our sometimes very narrow view of God. God is able to do what we through human eyes look at as absolutely impossible. Because that's the kind of God that he is. If only you and I could have the eyes of faith that would be look beyond what we see and look into the realm of the unknown and that we would be prepared to take the path less traveled. This is a new way that God is going to show them that we would trust God for the path that he lays out before us. It may be an unknown path. It may be a new path. It may be a scary path. There may be obstacles along the path that God lays out before us but if it is God leading us down that path then you can go with absolute confidence absolute assurance knowing that God will equip you to do whatever it is and overcome whatever obstacle lies in the way down the path that he is leading you what a wonderful God we serve don't minimize your expectations and your view of the greatness of God. This is a story I think I have told before, so bear with me. When Hudson Taylor went to China, he made a voyage on a sailing vessel. Hudson Taylor, that great missionary, as he neared the channel between southern Malay Peninsula and the island of Sumatra, the missionary heard an urgent knock on his stateroom door. He opened it and there stood the ship of the uh, the, the captain of the ship. Mr. Taylor, he said, we have no wind. We are drifting toward an island where the people are heathen and I fear they are cannibals. What can I do? asked Taylor. I understand that you believe in God. I want you to pray for wind. All right, Captain, I will, but you must set the sail. Why, that's ridiculous. There's not even the slightest breeze. Besides, the sailors would think I'm crazy. But finally, because of Taylor's insistence, he agreed. 45 minutes later, he returned and found the missionary still on his knees. You can stop praying now, said the captain. We've got more than enough wind to know what to do with. 
God's purpose for Hudson Taylor wasn't to perish. And his purpose for him was to continue to serve him. And so God provided the wind necessary for that ship to continue. And God's presence was with Israel. God's presence was symbolized by that ark. And God was reassuring Israel that they could cross that Jordan. It was a massive barrier. But nothing is too difficult for God. Nothing, Luke one thirty seven, is impossible for God. With man, Jesus says, these things are impossible. But with God can do anything. And where God's purposes are in process of being accomplished, then God will do whatever he needs to do in order for those purposes to be accomplished. So can I encourage you, Christian, to trust in the Lord, whatever the crisis is that you may experience, whatever the challenges life may present to you, that you don't allow yourself to be pressed down by the things that cause you fear and anxiety, but that you turn your eyes towards heaven and you say to the Lord, I don't know how this is going to resolve itself. I don't know how you're going to move. I can't see a solution to this particular dilemma that I'm facing. But I'm going to trust you, Lord. I'm going to trust you to strengthen me and to enable me to be able to see the light at the end of the tunnel. For you are a great God. And if God is working out his purposes in your life, then let me assure you, God will accomplish everything that he sets out to do in your life as you live in submission and obedience to him. Thirdly, I want you to notice the necessity of exercising faith. Look at verses 14 to 17. The necessity of exercising faith. So when the people broke camp to cross the Jordan, the priests carrying the Ark of the Covenant went ahead, went ahead of them. Now the Jordan is at flood stage or during harvest. Yet as soon as the priests who carried the ark reached the Jordan and their feet touched the water's edge, the water from the upstream stopped flowing. It piled up in a heap a great distance away at a town called Adam in the vicinity of Zarathon. While the water flowing to the sea of the Araba, the salt sea was completely cut off. So the people crossed over the opposite side, opposite Jericho rather. The priests who carried the Ark of the Covenant of Yahweh stood on firm on dry ground in the middle of the Jordan while all Israel passed until the whole nation had completed crossing on dry ground. Now I want you to, to see the sequence here. It's really important that we get this. Faith requires a response. You can't just sit back and say, I believe, I believe, and not do anything about it. You, you see, it's not enough just to have a, a head knowledge and allow all the, the facts of Scripture to penetrate into your head and, and to articulate that you do have faith without your faith actually being worked out. This miracle that is about to happen, and it is a great miracle, requires that the priests get their feet wet. Now, it's almost at an afterthought that the author mentions and says, by the way, the Jordan River is in flood. It's, it's, it's almost like an addendum. It's almost as if he, he almost forgot to put it in there. Now, I want to quote one of the commentators because I think he puts this in perspective. Listen to what he says. The actual Jordan Valley between the Sea of Galilee and the Dead Sea varies in breadth from 5 to 24 kilometers. Within this valley is the river's floodplain, which is 180 meters to 1.6 kilometers wide. The floodplain was packed with tangled bush and jungled growth. Hence, it was not the river so much as the jungle that was difficult to cross the fords of the Jordan as much ways through the jungle as through the river. Then there was the river channel itself. If similar to the 19th century, conditions was from 90 to 100 feet broad with a depth of about a meter and a half. Some it falls to as much as three to four meters. The current was strong because of the drop of elevation, a drop of about um, 
64 kilometers near the Sea of Galilee, an average of about 16 kilometers on average. Now, when you think about that, that's a huge, huge obstacle. And when God causes the, the Jordan River to pile up at Adam opposite Jericho, it's a long, long way away to where the Israelites probably crossed the Jordan. And so now God has created this massive uh, uh, channel that's dry so that these people who are gathered there don't just cross in single file, but cross in a, in a massive breadth through the Jordan River. And he keeps it, in spite of flood, piled up there. But it only happens when the priests put their feet in the water. Faith requires a response. It requires action. It's not enough just to say, I believe, and not do anything about your belief. You see, it's the same, exactly the same principle for those who don't know Christ. They are in the same position. It's not enough to say, well, I do actually believe that there is a God and have some kind of concept about who that God is. No, it's not enough even to say, I believe in God. Because James says, even the demons believe in God. And they shudder. They are afraid in their belief in God. No, faith means I take my belief and I put it into action. So in the same way that the Israelites stood at the mouth, at, at the side, the banks of that river, and those priests who faced this impossible task, helpless to do anything about it, in the same way the unbeliever stands uh, at the precipice, helpless to cross over the river, to cross over into the promised land, into the kingdom of God. He is in the kingdom of Satan, and there is this great big gulf between him and the kingdom of God, and he is helpless to get across that great gulf that exists. That river is impossible for him to cross. And the only way the unbeliever is able to get across to the other side is to trust in the Lord Jesus Christ who becomes the bridge that enables them to get from the land of Satan, the kingdom of Satan, into the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the only way they can do that is as Christ reaches out to them in grace and mercy and as Jesus who died on the cross to pay the penalty for their sin and to rescue them from their helpless position of being bound by Satan and bound by this and only when they trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and they take that step of faith by committing themselves to him by turning to him in faith only then are they able to access the bridge that crosses that river and that bridge is the Lord Jesus Christ it means coming to him it means submitting to him it means casting yourself at his feet it means trusting in his work alone on the cross and recognizing and understanding all of your feeble efforts to try and save yourself can't get you across that gulf there is a chasm too great for you to be able to get across and only through Christ are you able to get across that chasm and Jesus has provided the way and so he says um, God commands all people everywhere to repent believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved you need to respond in faith the call goes out and says sinner repent sinner believe in Jesus sinner put your hand in the hand of the master who reaches out to you and says turn 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 and be saved and as we bring ourselves to Jesus Christ and we lay ourselves at the foot of the cross and we leave our burden there and we look to the Savior and we put our trust in him that we are rescued and able to cross from Satan's kingdom into the kingdom of Christ, into the promised land. It's the same for these people. It's not enough just to stand on the side of the Jordan and look across into the promised land and say, we believe, we believe, we believe, and they stand. They have to do something. They have to put their feet in the water. And that's exactly what the priests do. The moment they do, the flow stops. And God backs that flow up. 
creating this wide path that the Israelites can cross over into the promised land. Let me tell you, my dear friends, as a believer, faith without works is dead, says James. It's the same for us. As it is for the unbeliever. We need to get our feet wet. We need to put our faith into practice. We need to do what God has called us to do. We can't just stand at the precipice and say, I believe, I believe, without getting our feet wet. Can I close again with a wonderful illustration that really brings us home with force? This is a professor speaking. In college, I was asked to prepare a lesson to teach my speech class. We were to be graded on our creativity and ability to drive home a point in a memorable way. My title of the talk was The Law of the Pendulum. I spent 20 minutes carefully teaching the physical principle that governs a swinging pendulum. The law of the pendulum is a pendulum can never return to the point higher than the point from which it was released because the friction and gravity when the pendulum returns will fall short of its original release point. Each time it swings, it makes less and less of an arc until it finally comes to rest. The point of the rest is called the state of equilibrium where all forces acting on the pendulum are equal. I attached a three-foot string, one-meter cord, to the top of a to the child's toy top and secured it to the top of the blackboard with a thumbtack. I pulled the top of one side and made a mark on the blackboard where I let it go. Each time it swung back, I made a new mark. It took less than a minute for the top to complete its swinging and come to rest. When I finished the demonstration, the markings on the blackboard proved my thesis. So the top is swinging on the blackboard and each time he's marking it as it swings. When I finished the demonstration, uh, I, I asked how many people believe the law of the pendulum to be true. All my classmates raised their hands. So did the teacher. He started to walk in front of the room thinking the class was over. In reality, it had just begun. Hanging from the steel ceiling beams in the middle of the room was a large, crude, but functional pendulum. And it was about 100 kilograms, 120 kilograms in weight, tied to four strands of a 250 kilogram parachute cord. I invited the instructor to climb on a table and sit in a chair with his back of his head against a cement wall. Then I brought the 120 kilograms of metal up to his nose. And he's sitting against the wall and this pendulum is brought up to his nose. Holding the huge pendulum just a fraction of a, a, a centimeter from his face, I once again explained the law of the pendulum only moments later that he had demonstrated the law of the pendulum is true. Then when I release this mass of metal, it will swing across the room and return short of the release point. Your nose will be in no danger. After that final restatement of this law, I looked him in the eye and said, Sir, do you believe the law is true? There was a long pause. Huge beads of sweat formed on his upper lip. And he weakly nodded his head and whispered, Yes. I released the pendulum. It made a swishing sound as it arced across the room. At the far end of its swing, it paused momentarily and started back. I never saw a man move so fast in my life. He literally dived from the table, deftly stepping around the still swinging pendulum. I asked the class, does he believe in the law of the pendulum? The students unanimously answered, no. You see, it's not enough just to believe. Faith requires action and whether you're a believer and needing to put your faith into action in whatever area it is that it needs to be applied. James says so clearly faith without works is dead. It's not enough to claim you've got faith without proving your faith by the demonstration of how you live and how you serve and what you do. Faith always expresses itself 
The same for the unbeliever. Until you take your hand and put it in the master's hand, until you confess, until you repent, until you turn away, you haven't exercised faith, until you rest yourself in the arms of the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in his finished work and trust him for your salvation, you're not saved. And then when you are saved and when you have trusted in God and you do exercise faith, it is then applied by the way in which I live. My life then becomes a testimony, becomes evidence of my faith, how I live, the attitudes I display, the actions that I do are all expressions of faith. And when we believe God and when we believe Him for great things, there is nothing that God cannot accomplish through you in your weakness. If only, if only you and I would trust God for great things and believe that he is able to accomplish great things and to sometimes put ourselves out on the limb where God has called us, where God has moved us, where God has given us direction, clear direction where God has spoken to us and trust him implicitly. For we serve a great God. Amen. Our Father, we thank you for your greatness. We thank you for the fact that you are a miracle working God. In fact, salvation is a miracle. I pray for those who don't know you, that they would trust you, truly trust you and turn to you and take that step of faith that perhaps they've been resisting. I pray for those who do know you, that you would help them to live out their faith. And perhaps if you're calling them to do something that seems very scary, that you would help them to have the ability to trust you and that you would do in them and through them for your glory great things. For Jesus' sake, amen. God bless you and I trust that you will have a wonderful week that lies ahead.